Holding on. All right. Okay. Welcome everyone um, to our um, sustainability in aerospace session. Um, this is a very, very kind of exciting um, session for us and has kind of evolved over the past few weeks. Um, to kind of introduce myself, I'm Gabby. I'm the program director of the HI Boeing Accelerator. Um, if you haven't heard of the Accelerator yet, um, you know, make sure to get in touch and, and ask any questions you might have. We have opened application for the new program already. And this time we want to work with startups that make a real difference in um, everything sustainability related. Um, so we'll be talking about, you know, what that looks like and why that's important in the session. But when we say sustainability, we don't only talk about alternative um, energy solutions or like fuel efficiency. For us, sustainability also has to do with something else. Um, something this industry in particular has a rather big problem with, um, which is diversity. <laughs> and we believe that um, to, to make a real difference, um, solving this problem um, will actually lead to us, um, you know, um, having a more sustainable industry and future for everyone involved. Um, so without further ado, um, I would love to introduce you to our great panelists. Um, we have four amazing um, ladies with us today. Um, I will go kind of in the order that my screen is showing me here. Um, first, I've had Vera Johnson, who is um, the founder of Circular. Then I've got Kimberly Perkins, who is um, a Gulfstream 650 captain and president and um, founder of um, Aviation for Humanity. Then I've got Rachel Everard. Everard, I probably still said that wrong. Everard. Everard, yeah. Everard. Close um, enough. <laughs> who is head of sustainability at Rolls Royce. And we have Melissa Orm with us, um, who is the vice president of Boeing Additive Manufacturing and um, used to be CTO for um, Morph 3D Inc. Um, so a really, really varied kind of mix of different backgrounds um, and, and experiences in here. And um, yeah, I mean, I just gave a brief overview, but um, our panelists will do a much better job in introducing themselves. So um, over to you, um, who would like to start? <laughs> Any volunteers? Sure, I can start, yeah. Uh, so my name is Kimberly Perkins. I'm a captain on a Gulfstream 650. I've been in business aviation for 10 years, and previous to that, I flew for the airlines. I've piloted jet aircraft on six continents and have lived on three. Uh, I now call Seattle my home. I am the founder and president of Aviation for Humanity, which is a not-for-profit organization that uses the traveling public to bring school supplies to underfunded schools, shelters, and orphanages around the world. I also uh, research, write, and speak about diversity and inclusion in aviation, and I am the co-founder of Third Wave Aviation, which is a company focused on providing uh, aviation and aerospace industries with inclusion program. Thank you, Kimberly. Yeah. Would you like me to go next? Yes, I can do that. that okay. Good. So um, as you said, my name is Melissa Orm and I'm the vice president of um, Boeing Additive Manufacturing or BAM as we call it. And so my career path has been very diverse and somewhat unusual. I began in academia and I rose to full professor in the University of um, California. And in that capacity, several decades ago, um, I developed many methods of net form manufacturing based on um, molten metal droplet deposition. And so that was a predecessor of additive manufacturing. Um, later, I became involved with the startup, as you mentioned, more 3D. And um, I was named CTO of that company. And so that's a startup company that focuses on metal additive manufacturing for the aerospace industry. And so in that capacity, we, we developed um, the manufacturing and, op and uh, um, operational process flows that um, uh, enable the traceability that's required by the aerospace industry for additive manufacturing. Um, later, I, we qualified to Boeing as a supplier among many other um, large OEMs and uh, Boeing reached out to me and asked me to join their team um, as vice president of additive manufacturing. So at Boeing now, um, so I've gone academia, small business, and now large corporate. Um, we focus on polymer and metal flyway parts and tooling. And, you know, we have a very long history of additive at, uh, at Boeing, uh, beginning with the 
polymer, and more recently in metals um, on the um, aircraft, rotorcraft, uh, um, satellites, and other space and launch applications. So much of our, um, our focus now is on enabling the digital thread um, for quality and scale. Um, we do a lot of um, uh, modeling and simulation, and, and the idea is that uh, additive manufacturing can be employed to create differentiating parts, more sustainable parts, parts that use, you know, um, uh, differentiating vehicles, right? Vehicles that have less drag, use less fuel, are more sustainable, um, and, and additive is a big enabler for that. So we're committed to building products for a healthy environment in a healthy environment, um, and really uh, focusing on diversity and inclusion in our workforce. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Who would like to go next? Yep, I can go next. There's a two <laughs> hard acts to follow, I must admit, but I'm Rachel Everard. I'm the Head of Sustainability for Rolls-Royce based uh, here in sunny London today. Um, and in my role, I head up our sustainability strategy policy reporting across our environmental, social and ethical impacts of the business. Um, I guess a little bit about me. I joined Rolls-Royce eight years ago, actually straight out of university. Interestingly, having studied for a master's in sustainable development at St. Andrews in Scotland. Um, joined Rolls-Royce and spent a couple of years on the graduate program in a variety of different roles across hs and &E and operations and then yeah for the last 18 months I've been in, in my current role. Brilliant, thank you Rachel. Vera? Hi everyone, I'm Vera Johnson, I'm the co-founder of Circular. We provide a um, software solution that enables our customers to track raw materials through their complex supply chains globally and to demonstrate responsible sourcing and sustainability. How we got involved in the aerospace industry is through the ATI Boeing Accelerator Program. We're exploring how we can use our traceability solution to track things like, as Melissa says, the authenticity of plane parts, um, carbon emission tracking and also the way in which um, the platform can be um, helpful in terms of responsible tracing and responsible sourcing and recycling. Amazing, lovely. Thank you, Vera. So let's, I mean, let's kick off with you um, for kind of one of the initial um, questions while, while I've got you kind of speaking. Um, we, we had sort of in our initial conversation the question around what does sustainability um, mean to you? But other than that, like what does sustainability look like or why is it important? But what kind of effect did COVID-19 had on it this year? Um, how have you felt it as a, as a startup founder? So to answer your first question about sustainability and sustainability in the aerospace generally, what we found is that by applying new technology to old school business problems, which is in a complex supply chains, complex um, characteristics of material as it passes through a supply chain, but also the ability to have transparent supply chains and give um, data that sits behind that has been probably the most important thing. What we've realized very quickly is that as a business, we give um, confidence in data and confidence in transactions, and especially the ability to understand the resilience of supply chains because once you know what a supply chain is comprised of, an, an organization and especially sustainable, sustainability as part of that becomes um, effectively a mainstream agenda. Mm -hmm. As a business, we um, started the whole lockdown period as a startup. And during that entire process, COBIS actually helped us as a technology platform to become not only um, invested in, but also to become immediate, immediately scalable. So we're now a scale-up business in that short period of time. And we have used the technology to be able to not just install the platform globally, but actually teach our clients how best to exploit it in order to drive more responsible sourcing and responsible recycling. And in many ways, diversity has actually helped us achieve that. And... Um, we, we never realized how important diversity was as part of that, particularly in terms of workforce and diverse thinking. Mm. Mm. Very, very interesting. And um, in terms of why, why that diversity was such an important part of, you know, getting you through the door with some of your clients, like how, how, how would you describe that? I guess the biggest challenge was about, um, particularly in this COVID environment, providing 
genuine provenance data that could be trusted and therefore you know digitizing the supply chain and doing it remotely allows us to be able to, as a company, demonstrate that this is an important thing. Mm -hmm. And especially in terms of materials traceability, especially where most of the materials such as um, cobalt, mica, nickel are typically found in areas of conflict. And being able to do that with confidence actually allows us to provide that um, value chain protection. Mm -hmm. Amazing. That's, that's a really, really um, interesting kind of perspective from a more start startup point of view. I'd love to hear what, um, for example, Melissa, what what yeah. you... Well, for sustainability in general, to, to begin with that, you know, we really need to look at the carbon footprint from the entire value stream, right? So manufacturing in general, you know, it's uh, the conversion of materials into goods. So that starts with mining the material, then, then converting that material into something that we can manufacture and then the actual manufacturing process, um, post processes, the, the use of that product in, in service, the airplane, for example, it's um, end of life, you know, um, whether we refurbish, repair, or recycle. So that whole value stream, we look at the carbon footprint, right? And so what we try to do is minimize that comp a carbon footprint on every single one of those, one of those steps. With respect to COVID, I think what happened um, for, for Boeing, at least there was a lot of you know, excitement and uh, I mean, there was, um, you know, uh, there was such urgency that, um, you know, sustainability may have been, you know, not the highest priority in the first couple of months, right? There was disposable gloves, one use masks, um, just get these to, to people. But then, then we looked at the longer term or the larger aspects. And so Boeing began to make face shields. We made 40,000 and we did them in, um, at point of use to reduce transportation and the emissions from that. So we made 40,000 in, in 18 locations um, in 18 Boeing sites across the country, not one, right? And then that uh, um, we were able to, you know, um, deliver them to, to local places like that. So with respect to COVID, we started examining how we can integrate our sustainable philosophy into actually doing that. Other ways we, um, Boeing as a company, donated um, four and a half million PPEs around the world. And they did this um, transporting it in the 787 Dreamliner. And that's um, a, an aircraft that has um, great um, efficiencies in terms of CO2 emissions. Since I think since it was uh, um, developed, there's been like, you know, 40 uh, billion pounds less, you know, uh, um, fuel use. So, so looking for ways to, um, you know, to transport these goods in a way that's, that's um, really reduces the carbon footprint. And finally, all of us, you know, in the workplace, if we can work remotely, we are, right? And so um, we're, we're not traveling to and from work. Um, you know, that uh, um, I'm, I live in California, so we have horrible weather right now because of fires but otherwise it's been very clean you know I mean the, the, the impacts to the environment have, were noticed um, before the, these um, these current events but uh, um, so now we're looking at like well how can we in, you know incorporate this into our future I mean you know there we're, we're learning from this and and, and uh, from it, which we only you know um, experienced because of COVID right and so we're learning how, how can we how can we model this in the future? Will there be some opportunity? Um, and so we're looking at that too. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, a lot a lot has happened in the past couple of months, I think, in that. Yeah. Um, anything, Rachel, that you would like to add from the perspective of Rose Rice? Yeah, I think I guess I'd just say that I think if I step back and look at the kind of crux of the COVID crisis, if anything, it has really sort of demonstrated the fragility of unsustainable systems and accelerated the case for change here. Um, I think if you can compare, as Melissa said, the pace and agility with which we've been able to adapt to COVID with the response to the climate emergency, there's some real parallels and real lessons that we can draw upon to create a, a more sustainable society and a more sustainable organization as well for us and industry going forward. So I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, from Rolls-Royce's perspective, 
we have actually taken pretty significant steps for steps forward in in our sustainability journey and, and actually back in june um right at the point where flying hours were almost at their lowest um our ceo stood up and committed rolls royce to a pathway of net zero carbon emissions by 2050 which i think for me as a sustainability professional in the organization was a really proud moment but i also think for our in wider employees um and our the wider sector it's a real kind of sign of hope and a signal of the the kind of journey forward for us as an industry that we need to embrace awesome that sounds great and i i mean i would love to have um kimberly's take on this as well i mean as a as a as a pilot and kind of more from the aviation side yeah and i i think i i love everything that everyone's been saying and to me um i focus my view on sustainability is a little bit different um so you know, I believe, I guess this is two part question is the, the first part is what is sustainability in aerospace and aviation? And that means meeting the demands now without compromising the demands in the future. And so yes, we often think about more um, fuel efficient technologies and offsetting carbon emissions, but I think sustainability goes beyond aircraft, airports and technology. I think it's about the longevity and the health of the industry, which means the people in it. So um, I believe sustainability is having a pipeline of educated and interested personnel coming into the industry to constantly be innovating. So for the sake of sustainability, I advocate for investing in human capital. Um, and I think, and you asked about COVID. So absolutely, COVID has wreaked havoc, like full stop, end of sentence. So before I say that there's a silver lining or a glimmer of positivity, I feel like it's important to acknowledge the businesses that have closed down, the airlines that have had to furlough, and all of those that have been affected by COVID. Um, I do hope and believe that something positive will emerge from this. Uh, COVID has required all of us to take a pause and kind of reevaluate what's important. From COVID, we have learned that flexible work schedules and working from home are definitely viable options. But COVID has also magnified the inequalities, right? Like women are disproportionately disadvantaged by carrying a heavier burden of handling childcare and work. And COVID's magnified inequalities across social and economic systems. So it's put a spotlight on humanity and the, the industry itself will bounce back, right? Just like after 9-11, after the 2008 financial crisis, with time, it will bounce back. But um, my hope is that COVID has given us a necessary pause and a focus on humanity. So when we do bounce back, we are building something better than now, right? We're building something better than the status quo because right now it's not working for everybody, right? If you look at how many women are in aviation or black and brown people in aviation, you see uh, it is disproportionately white and it's disproportionately male. So it's not working for everybody. So I hope when we build a new system, we're building something that's more inclusive, more family friendly. And I, this is a long winded way of saying, okay, so how does COVID affect the sustainability agenda? From a micro view, I would say these are really tough times and it seems like a setback. But I truly believe from a macro view, years down the line, we'll realize that COVID forced industries to pivot and focus on the people the human capital and the new path will create an inclusive culture where diversity will naturally prosper, which means we've got the best setup for creativity and productivity. And so that's a win for sustainability agenda for both aviation and the aerospace industry. But we need to make sure this pivot counts and it's up to the individual in, uh, organizations and the people in them to make the most of rebuilding when it's time. Yeah, some really, really um, true and important points in there. Um, so, I mean, we've kind of got like these two things. Um, we have the sustainability aspect on the more kind of technological side of it. And then we've got this, um, you know, human side to it. And I think both are really, really important to talk about. Um, let's maybe kick off with the technological one, because that's what we kind of started off with, um, with, with um, the first couple of introductions. Um, my question here was, how can we ensure sustainability throughout the entire aircraft life cycle? Um, so for those of you um, kind of involved in those, those um, operational, uh, the operational side of that, um, I'd love to hear some ideas and some thoughts on that. Well, um, you know, I, I can, I can um, chime in here. I, I really, you know, this is, that's a tricky question, essentially. Um, we really, you know, sustainability has to be at the foundation of everything that we do, and, and, and it has to be part of our culture. 
you know, and, and not just uh, um, buzzwords, but something that we are really dedicated to, you know, and, and somehow we need to find ways to reward, I think, our suppliers, our customers um, for their commitment to sustainability. Um, and that could be in, you know, um, you know, the, well, there are various ways to do that, but, and also reward customers who are committed to sustainability during the lifetime of, of that aircraft or vehicle, whatever it may be, right? So it's, uh, um, it's really about, I think, providing motivations to, to customers and suppliers for prioritizing sustainability. Yeah, 100%. Just yeah. yeah, I think I can maybe build on that from Rolls Royce's perspective. And I, I think firstly, I wanted to say, I don't think you can divorce the technology aspects from the people aspects. I think they're completely embedded and intertwined. And in fact, I don't think you can create a sustainable product or a sustainable system without considering those broader impacts and, and kind of influences. Um, and I guess that comes to the question, how do you consider sustainability across the life cycle of an aircraft? You have to look at it holistically. Um, from Rolls Royce's perspective, we kind of can clearly state that the purpose and the biggest contribution that we can make to a more sustainable future is to reduce the carbon burden associated with flight. But you can't do that in a way that's not sustainable in its entirety. You have to look at what are the materials that you require. How can you source those responsibly? How can you recycle those? What impact does that have on your recycling rates and your ability to reuse and rework materials? So we have to look at it across the entire design life cycle and entire and from kind of cradle to grave or background cradle to cradle is the kind of new term, but looking at it holistically from a systems perspective is the only way to really achieve this. Yeah, 100%. Um, Vera, maybe from you, yeah. Yeah, um, I absolutely totally agree with that. And I think organizations that are open to building resilience in supply chains, and that's just not from the point of view of the initial procurement of the goods and materials, but it's the entire design of the processes, the functions, the management of the teams, and then equally the reporting and being open to transparency, I think is probably the key thing here. And what I'm seeing is that a lot more organizations are willing to do that, not just because they care about sustainability, they actually believe it, and the rhetoric and the words and the way in which they reward their suppliers and reward their staff is all honed down to to, you know how how good are we and how much better could we become yeah 100 percent and do do you think any of you like what would you say is at the moment the biggest challenge to to um achieving some of those goals i think if i may, if i may start i think there is not enough transparency about what is actually happening in the supply chain. And quite often, and I'm sure um, my um, co-host will probably agree, is that procurement is often the forgotten partner in any supply chain conversation. They always end up with the worst possible case of, here's your budget, go and do what you can with it. So I think the, the more we can engage with procurement at center stage and tie that with um, sustainability, that will actually be a massive step forward in terms of the way we think about um, materials, the traceability of it, the provenance. But equally, I think the ability to digitize the way in which things are done, especially transparency, would be really, really powerful. Yeah, I agree with Vera um, a lot. That's, that's, um, I, I think that the biggest challenge that we will have is, is um, for, you know, the the other you know companies suppliers customers to truly embrace sustainability and and bring it into their culture not just you know not just use it as talking points but to be true to that to believe in that and and to really work on it because a lot of times they will you know some might say Let, let's let's balance cost versus sustainability you know maybe this fuel is more expensive you know and 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 uh, we have to we have to work that together. We have to you know we have to to bring that together and make sure that they're rewarded for sustainability. But it really comes, I think, I think with the with the commitment and the realization that it needs to be part of the culture. Yeah, I think I fully agree with that. I think it it comes down to giving people the information, the tools that they need to make the right decisions. I don't think anyone 
goes to work wanting to be unsustainable in the way they go about their day. But if you don't give people the right information or the access to the right information to know what might be a, you know, a more sustainable or less sustainable choice and to particularly to explore the knock-on consequences of some of our decisions and actions, I think that's what's so difficult sometimes about sustainability is it's very broad and it's very complicated and it's not black and white. Um, it's often about these interdependencies that can be quite hard to get your head around. So the more information, the more transparency we can give people to help them to make informed decisions, then the better we can all be for it. Yeah, thank you. Really, really good point. Um, I think on my list next, I had kind of more of a broader question around, you know, what you um, as individuals, but also as organizations do to support this. But let's move that one to slightly later on and, and move to the more kind of, you know, diversity centered question to tie into what we've just been speaking about. Um, Kimberly, you've in your introduction already kind of touched on um, a lot of this, um, you know, around how sustainability and diversity are connected. Um, happy for you to add anything to that if you want. Yeah, sure, I'd love to. Um, so machines have been taking over humans' jobs for decades, right? We've we've set that up, and it's great. And uh, they'll, eventually, it will prob they'll probably take my job in the flight deck. I mean, the technology is already there. But something machines don't do well is uh, critically think, problem solve, create, innovate. So the humans are always going to have to be around to do these things. And uh, the best way to um, set ourselves up for that is through diversity and through inclusion, right? So Harvard Business Review did a study and found that diverse groups are more creative than homogenized groups. But diversity alone is not going to be enough. If diversity gives you uh, access to the room, inclusion gives you a seat at the table and an opportunity to be heard. So Forbes did a study and looked at diverse groups that were also inclusive and found that they were more productive and they made better decisions. So for sustainability's sake, we need diversity for the creativity and then we need inclusion for the productivity. Some really, really good points. And why do you think, um, all of you now, um, why do you think in terms of, for example, gender diversity, um, there is so few women in aerospace or aviation? Um, what, what is kind of the problem at the moment? Um, you know, I, Go ahead. Uh, what, uh, so answering the question why we think there is, are, are fewer women in aviation, I mean, there's misconceptions, right? I mean, um, I, you know, um, uh, well, I, people think that um, women aren't interested in airplanes. They think that they're not good at math. They think that uh, um, they're not ambitious. And part of that, you know, um, goes back to to girls when they're studying. You know, when they're when they're in school, you ask them what they want to be when they grow up, and they'll say singers, models, ballerinas. You know, and the boys will say, you know, doctors, the president of the United States, you know, um, things like that. And so I really think that in our society, um, you know, this, these sort of uh, gender roles are still are still there. And, and we need to, to to work, you know, as a community. Um, I think it's I think really think it's getting better. Um, I think I'm older than all of you. And when I was in um, in college in a class of 80 people, there were three women. And then when I was a graduate student, I was the only one. And then when I was a professor, I was the only female in my department. Um, and so, you know, I was really odd. I was the, you know, um, a, a singularity. And um, that whereas now, you know, I look at, uh, I'm on the board of my um, old university and there's 20%, right? And so from the class of 80, there would be 20 instead of three, right? And so, um, you know, there, there's been a lot of really good gains over, over the, you know, decades, I'll say. But, um, you know, we, we, there's still a lot of uh, misconceptions. And I think that women um, generally, you know, um, behave differently than men in terms of, of um, assuming what they can do, assuming that they, they deserve a seat at the table, you know. Um, and, and uh, you know, I would like to advise, you know, young women to, to go for it, aim high, you can do it, go for the, you know, have your sights on, on that highest table, you know. Um, but I don't think that's really still ingrained from a, from a societal point of view. 
We're getting better though, I think. Yeah. Can I go next? I'd love to follow up on that. Yeah. I, I think it's such an important topic. And as far as um, misconceptions, I mean, we could write an entire book on the misconceptions of women in aerospace and aviation industry. Um, so I'd love to answer this question from my perspective uh, as a pilot and as a mom, I have two young daughters. Um, and I often hear people say things like, oh, she didn't, you know, she left aviation because she wanted to focus on her family or uh, she just wasn't interested in aviation or um, she left the flying career because she wanted to be home more often. And I think, I think that's a misconception. Um, it's a convenient explanation to a much more complicated problem. Uh, just to give some uh, quantifiable context to this. So in the United States, female student pilots make up 14% of the industry. And as they progress, we start to see that number deteriorate. But by the time they reach their commercial pilot's license, it's cut in half to 7%. And if they reach the highest pilot's license, which is the ATP, the airline transport pilot's license, it's down to 4.5%. So even if we get women into the industry, uh, as far as pilots go, we're losing them somewhere along the way. And you know, I, this is a great question. Why is this happening? So I, um, I've been conducting research around this and I, I've done surveys and polls. And one of my surveys I, I conducted was 100 uh, career female pilots. And the first question I asked is, yeah, where are the women? Why aren't they here? Um, and the highest response was a lack of representation uh, or the, I just didn't know I could do it. But what was really fascinating is the second highest response, which was at 24%, said that the number one reason women don't show up in aerospace or aviation is because of bias and discrimination, meaning it's a good old boys club, there's a negative culture. So I said, okay, well, this question's really geared on recruitment. How about the retention piece? So I asked, what's the one thing we could do in the industry to prevent women from leaving? And the, the highest response was um, better schedule predictability, which as a mom makes total sense. Um, but what was really surprising is this bias and discrimi discrimination showed up again, 33%. So a third of these women said the number one thing we could change is to end bias and discrimination. So we see this coming up in both the recruitment and the retention. I mean, we're missing, in, we're missing women in, in aviation, not because of family reasons or for a lack of in interest. It's because I truly believe of bias and discrimination at kind of all levels. And luckily, there's a solution. I mean, the, the whole world right now is getting a very fast lesson on bias and systemic injustices. And our industry needs training around inclusive language and behavior and education on implicit and systemic bias. And I, I truly believe we'll find more women in aerospace when we create uh, a culture where we're allowed to be our authentic selves and a, a culture of inclusivity which really is what laid the, the groundwork for me co-founding Third Wave Aviation. And that's our goal is to, to give training and language around the concepts of bias and how it affects um, recruitment and retention of minorities in aviation, but also how it affects aviation safety. Um, and sorry, I know I have the talking stick here for a long time, but I'm, I'm really passionate about this. And, and um, I do believe this affects our, our safety level. So in, in the 1970s, there were a bunch of crashes that occurred and uh, there were, NTSB found that it was this like singular captain mentality that was causing these issues. So crew resource management came out. That is a safety uh, process about, um, you know, how do we communicate in the flight deck? Years, decades later, 2006, safety management system came out. Now this is a more holistic approach to safety. It's looking at organizations' safety culture and, and that's great. And it's also about communication and human factors. But all of these safety protocols and processes break down without inclusion, meaning inclusive language and a feeling a sense of belonging. And so I do feel like the third wave of aviation safety is more this human capital, a human element, and creating a culture of inclusivity where diversity naturally thrives. I think that was a long-winded answer. Oh, there you go. Well, I'm sure, I mean, there was a lot of really, really interesting and useful stuff in there. I mean, um, it sounds also like really, really exciting kind of the studies and the surveys you did, um, some really, really interesting data there. Um, as kind of a, a um, founder, um, a startup founder, um, recent now <laughs> in, in aerospace, Vera, how has your experience been with all of that? I guess I've been quite fortunate that I've been in the IT industry for over 20, 
25 years, I have to admit, and I've seen a huge amount of change where diversity and um, female gender balance and diversity in its broader context was not really a thing. But over the last 10 years, it has become prominent. And that's because I think um, it's become a boardroom agenda and diversity of talent, diversity of thinking, diversity of leadership are the, the really big things that change an organization's perspective, right down to the way in which a company's mission is translated to the recruitment plan and the way in which a recruiter actually interviews an individual based on a set of credentials, a set of criteria. Doug and I, um, who's my co-founder, made the decision when we first started Circular that we would be um, unconsciously and consciously biased towards hiring in talent, even if they scared us, even if they were better than us, because that actually brings a whole new set of dynamics as to how we operate as a company. They teach us things that we don't know. At the same time, we, even as an IT business, working with the aerospace sector as our clients, we've actually found it really refreshing to engage with the industry in the sense that it's much more open than it would have been even years ago with even me as a co-founder with all the diversity challenges and tick boxes I tick. So it's been amazing from that perspective. What I would say is that the rhetoric from the board has to cascade all the way through in terms of you know HR policies, reward mechanisms, through to payroll, through to the way in which we recruit. And if any one of those elements doesn't work or is out of step, then it's very difficult to achieve diver genuine diversity. Very, very true. And if we think about, um, you know, young women that are thinking potentially to, to, to um, get started in aerospace aviation, but are sort of scared of, you know, some of these, um, you know, probably also misconceptions of what the industry looks like, but um, what, you know, what advice would you give someone like that? anyone really who does. yeah i mean i would definitely it's it's very clear advice you know um to to not to assume that there are barriers to you because you're a woman you know to to work hard um, work hard in math and sciences do your best but aim really high and go for that high position assume assume it's yours you know and then just you know work hard to take it um that that was really what i would tell them yeah, I, I think just to follow up on that, I, I, would, um, I would also advocate that they don't have to buy into the default, right? What I mean by that is just because something has always looked a certain way or been done a certain way doesn't mean it needs to keep being that way. Uh, so as I mentioned, career female pilots, they make up just about 5% of the industry in the United States. And as captains, we make up just 2%. So that means the default is, is obviously male. And um, a common pattern that sometimes emerges when there's such a, a drastic uh, minority versus majority is this idea of like having to blend in or, you know, in aviation, I hear a lot, oh, you have to be able to hang with the guys. And, um, and that's called conformity for social capital, meaning the more that you can just blend in or hang out, the bigger your network becomes. But that also means that you have to give up a little piece of yourself, right? It means that you have to lose your own identity to fit some arbitrary mold. But it also means that if you do that, you're then making the next generation of women coming in having to do the same thing. So I'm advocating like, let's break that cycle. And, and if we don't challenge and, and question these defaults in our own industries, who will? And, and we can challenge it just by succeeding in our job, doing a great job while remaining our 100% authentic selves. And um, I think growth and progress comes from challenging the status quo. So, so don't buy into the default. Awesome. I was going to say exactly the same. I was going to uh, say about not conforming to any kind of notion of what a aerospace individual professional looks like. Um, I think that's really important. And I think we all have a, a duty and a role to play in helping with that as well um, and bringing our authentic selves to the workplace every day and being successful as our authentic selves, I think is really important and showing people from all, all kind of walks of life and generations within the industry and outside the industry that you don't have to be a certain something to be um, in aerospace. And that's something in my own experience. And I haven't experienced some of the circumstances that Kimberly spoke to, I must say at Rolls Royce, but I, I do gen genuinely bring my authentic self to work every day and uh, for better or for worse, my colleagues might say. Um, 
I think also as women, we also have a, a role to play in mentoring. Um, I think that's such an important thing. And both up, down, left, right, sideways, I think the stronger and the better we can be as women supporting other women and, and everyone in, in the organization, again, we're going to help move us forward um, and break those kind of barriers down. And it helps us to create that more inclusive culture that I think we're all saying is really important. Yeah, really, really good point. I think that that applies, I mean, not only to, to kind of um, aerospace and aviation, but the tech sector in general, I think it's a really, really important point. Um, amazing. Um, so I'll jump back to one of the sort of um, questions that um, captures all of those elements a little bit and would love to find out what you or your organizations actually do to, um, you know, achieve or to help us achieve a more sustainable industry. Tell us about some of those initiatives. Um, I'll begin on this because, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite excited about that. So um, from a, a Boeing corporate view and as well, and then from my own organization of additive manufacturing. So for, you know, Boeing corporate, I mean, um, there's some real, real proud moments when, you know, um, I, I learned what, what Boeing does. First of all, in transparency, I've only been there less than a year and a half. Um, you know, uh, and so, so I, I'm learning things. I, I recently learned that um, two of our factories, one in Renton and one in Charleston, is, is, um, they are both completely um, powered by renewable energy sources. And then 50% of all of the other electrical, uh, electricity uses are also renewable sources. Um, that just, you know, I think that's, that's really amazing and I'm, I'm quite proud of them for that. Um, it, we've reduced our emissions in our operations, you know, in our factories by 29% in the past uh, decade, right? Which is, um, you know, so, so they're do, you know, we're doing really great strides to, to reduce our operational emissions. And then when it comes to creating airplanes and other products, um, the latest 777X, as you may have seen, it's that beautiful plane that has the, the folding wingtips, you know, so it's long, but the folds so that it can fit in the airport gate, right? Well, that, that's, that uses 19% um, lower fuel, uh, which is big, obviously, commensurate, you know, emission reduction. Um, so everything that, that Boeing is doing in the future now really looks to reducing the carbon footprint. And we see it in the factories, how we operate. Um, how much we recycle from the um, 787, which has a lot of carbon fiber. Um, they're reducing, uh, you know, millions of pounds of this recycled material and it's becoming laptop cases and, and, and car parts and things like that. So there's a lot of really, really great stories that, that Boeing is doing and they're still, still working to do more. With respect to additive manufacturing, my field, um, this is really exciting for me because it's a driver for sustainability. Um, so in terms of the actual manufacturing process, this isn't a 3D printing forum. So, um, you know, basically we use less material to make the same parts. You know, there's something called the buy to fly ratio. Um, traditionally hogged out parts might be 20 to one, meaning that you need 20 times the material of the actual final part. You know, additive manufacturing, it's close to one. It's not one, but it's close to one. So you use significantly less material. So all of those pre-manufacturing steps of mining, material conversion, transportation, all that is really greatly reduced. Um, and, and so then um, making lighter weight parts then, of course, is going to make your vehicle, your product lighter weight. You're going to use less fuel to propel it, right? And so additive manufacturing enables new aircraft that can't be made or spacecraft or helicopter, whatever, new vehicles that cannot be made otherwise and it enables them to be much more um, efficient with respect to fuel consumption and, and lower emissions. So, so my field is, is very um, strong as a, as a driver for additive manufacturing and our Boeing in general, um, my company really makes me proud, you know, what, what I see them doing. Uh, one more thing, you know, for example, there's a new um, uh, um, site in India and the whole site was designed with the environmental footprint in mind, you know, using reclaimed water for irrigation and for restrooms and, um, you know, solar, solar panels. I mean, it's just really, every, everything that we're doing is really through the lens of sustainability. That was very long-winded, but, uh, you know, I was really, really proud to, to see what we're doing. 
Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Mm. Yeah. Who'd That's like possible. to tell us more about their um, sustainability initiatives? Well, I can go. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm looking at sustainability from the, you know, investing in people, the human capital side. So, which is why I, I mentioned third wave aviation. We are creating an aviation specific inclusion program uh, for, you know, businesses and organizations in aerospace and aviation. I also do a lot of research writing and speaking about diversity and inclusion as it affects sustainability, as it affects aviation safety. And um, I also serve on the National Business Aviation Association Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity Working Group. And so NBAA is, um, has some great initiatives and um, starting with an awareness campaign. And you'll start seeing some more stuff rolling out uh, on that in the next uh, couple of months. Great. I can go next. I think I already said a lot of this. Um, in my introduction actually, but I, I guess I think Rolls-Royce in particular has um, a really important role to play in leading the transition to a low carbon or a net zero carbon economy and future. And I think the technologies that we kind of pioneer and are proud to pioneer for aviation can help us there. Um, in particular, um, call on the, the Trent XWB with the world's most efficient aero engine flying today, which is Rolls-Royce, um, and kind of how we can build on that history of a, the more efficient engine. And also then looking at kind of more novel technologies, the role of hybrid and electrification in aerospace, I think is, is really exciting. But right, I said, like I said at the start, while the biggest contribution we can make to a more sustainable society is to divorce the carbon burden of, of flight, um, it really is about making sure that we do that in a way that is holistically sustainable and it makes us a more responsible and resilient business, but it also means that the, the contribution we make to society is for the long term and it has a, a positive social value as well as a less bad environmental one. I can talk for the next like hour all about this, so I'll keep it super short. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Thank you, Rachel. And I guess from my perspective, the whole mission of Circular is about providing companies with the ability to have transparency in their supply chains, whether it's materials or whether it's parts. So sustainability is top, bottom and middle of our agenda. And I guess our passion is helping um, the aerospace industry understand how best to exploit the platform, whether it's about managing and tracking carbon emissions and reducing them, whether it's about tracking and tracing and understanding where the authenticity of plane parts are coming from, but also um, managing the supply chains such that there's much more known decision-making and open decision-making about recycling and the sourcing of materials. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, Circular is a great example of a, of a kind of smaller company really making a difference, I think, in the space. Um, so this is us in terms of our questions. Um, and we are kind of almost at the 10 minutes left mark. Um, and we've got loads of loads of questions that have come in through the Q&A. So in advance, if we don't get to your question, um, don't panic. We will make sure to, you know, share these with the panelists and, and um, sign up to newsletters and, and um, follow our blog. So we'll make sure to publish some, some um, content to answer hopefully all of those questions in one way or the other. But let's look at some of them. Um, for example, a question from Lee. Um, when we talk about sustainability, is it purely environmental or can it be business and technology focused? Uh, for example, making manufacturing more cost effective to keep a business viable. Does anyone have any um, thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I saw the question came in right at the very start. And I think, I hope that in the last 50 minutes, we've actually kind of answered that one for you, Lee, because I think it absolutely has to be, we have to look comprehensively at all of the impacts that we have, good and bad on society and on the environment. And to be sustainable, we have to kind of look at that lens of social, ethical, environmental impacts and make sure that we're reducing those to the negative ones to as low as possible and maximizing the positive opportunities and the maximizing the opportunities for shared value, both for our sector and our organizations, but for community and society at large as well. Amazing. Thank you, Rachel. Um, another one is about stakeholder engagement. How can we get senior stakeholders within organizations to consider sustainability as an important issue? Any thoughts? I, I would say make it personal. <laughs> make, it, make it their agenda. And unless it's impacting them as individuals or their environment 
or the context in which they operate, they will never take it seriously. The other, the other part of the answer, I think, would be giving them data of making bad decisions. You know, what is the impact of not caring? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else, any additions to that? Just, yeah, just to add on to that, I think it's very much about putting sustainability into the long language or the context of how the individual thinks, works, the part of the business they operate in. Um, I'm not going to go and talk to our finance team about how it would be great to do more STEM education just because for the children, I've got to go and talk to them about the kind of financial implications of the talent pipeline. Um, it, we all work with people that have different personal drivers and values, whether they are a strong climate advocate or a climate change denier. And it's just about making sure that when we talk to them about sustainability, we can contextualize it. I think people will always come down to risk and opportunity for the business. And you can always kind of win people over in that way. If you think about sustainability really as being part of the resilience of your business, which it, it, we all can agree it fundamentally is, but actually approaching it from that perspective rather than sustainability is like an add on as a do good. Um, it's about fundamentally ensuring the success of your business. I don't think anyone can really argue with that. I think I'd like to really foot stomp uh, Rachel's remark. You know, it, it really comes down to, you know, um, being being in the culture of, of the, the people, right? And and you want to, you know, you have to learn, you know, what drives them, what's important to them, and then show how in those things that are important to them, sustainability is an enabler, right? And, and uh, also, as Vera said, show them if you don't do that, what are the consequences, right? So, but, uh, you know, find, find what motivates them, you know, and what they're really interested in, and then, and then work, you know, your sustainability um, into that, right? Mm-hmm. Great, thank you, Melissa. Um, okay, let me see what else do we have here. There's lots and lots of good ones. Um, okay, how about... Um, how can you convince suppliers and other key stakeholders to give you more transparency and share more information about the supply chain? What could help with that? I, I guess I'll, I'll, let me share an example of um, yeah. what we're doing with um, an automotive client. Mm -hmm. They've made it a both a competitive advantage by wanting to share transparency data, but at the same time, they're being rewarded with longer term contracts. So there's a genuine symbiotic relationship in terms of a real partnership that both, both parties or the supply chain partners actually care about where the materials are flowing and actually taking responsibility of what comes in their role in the process and then what comes out and gets passed down to the next chain and having that um, genuine shared conversation is actually the thing that makes the biggest difference in terms of supply chain transparency. Yeah, I was going to wait for you. I figured that that was right up your alley and you were going <laughs> to say something there. But I, I think the, the important um, aspect here is, is the relationship with the supplier customer is that it's a real relationship um, and it's not just a transactional um, agreement, right? So instead of having a transaction, you want to have you know, a partnership, right? Where you're you're working together, and uh, um, you know you you provide you you know the transparency goes, flows both ways as well, right? And and you're working together, and uh, you know if it's a business model where it's just a transaction, you're not going to have transparency at all. So you have to get past the transactional, um, uh, you know, relationship and go into one that's a true partnership. Really, really good point. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is an interesting one. No worries if you can't think of something from the top of your head, but Matt says, as an inspiration to us all, can anyone give an example of a situation where you consciously held on to how you are and fought against becoming just one of the guys? I don't want to put anyone in the spot, so please consider it more on the light side of things. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I can... I can shed some light on that in a kind of a variety of different ways. I mean, um, I think it's important first to say that uh, there's two real different types of bias, right? There's implicit bias and there's explicit bias. And I think um, people experience both on varying degrees. For example, uh, explicit bias. I was once flying in the United States. Uh, I, I keyed the mic to talk to air traffic control and somebody else on that frequency came back and said, oh, another empty kitchen 
right? And so that's a perfect example of explicit bias. But implicit bias uh, shows up all the time in um, you know, walking down the halls of a flight training facility and all the, the images are of men. And you sit down to go through ground school and the PowerPoint presentation, anytime they refer to a pilot, it's always masculine. So individually, these little tiny things don't matter, but collectively they paint a picture where the default is male and that being a woman, I'm outside of that normal realm. Another example is when I was pregnant, I have two, two children. And so both times when I was pregnant, I was flying. And I would often get asked by people in the industry and out, gosh, how are you going to be a mom and a pilot? Oh my gosh, how is that going to happen? Well, my husband's also a pilot. You know how many times he's been asked that? Zero, zero number of times. So it's this bias, this default where um, women either have to be this like stay at home caregiver or they have to have a career, but we men have been having both forever and we certainly can have both. So um, I'm not 100% sure I answered that question exactly with one specific thing, but I think it's important to um, acknowledge the explicit bias, which is very obvious, um, and then versus the implicit bias. And that's actually, I think, more dangerous because it's more pervasive and it's more insidious and it happens all the time. And they're like these little tiny microaggressions that add up to just paint this, this picture where um, you know, women are something different than the default. We're, we're different, we're not normal. And um, that's something that I'm, I'm hoping to, uh, to see that all of us collectively are, are fixing that. We have a lot of male allies who are trying to change the status quo and we have a lot of women that are just showing up and being their authentic selves. And like Rachel mentioned earlier, mentoring. I think it's important to mentor in all different ways and sometimes have the younger, it's really interesting in my perspective, I see um, some people of an older generation might say, oh, you just laugh off the bias. But then the younger generation is saying, no, I'm not, I'm not willing to let that go, right? And so we're trying to bridge the gap here of um, how best to, to challenge the status quo. But I, I think we are, and I think, um, I'm, I'm glad to see that question came from a Matt, which I'm assuming is a male. So I appreciate those questions. I think it's important <laughs> to have the majority um, ask questions around this because I, I think we'll move the needle faster when we're all involved in it. 100%. Totally. I think I'm quite lucky in the sense that um, with Circular, we're literally 50-50 in terms of um, gender balance. And we're fortunate that my colleague Doug has seen me personally go through some of those issues, Kim, that you faced and consciously choosing to do better than my colleague just because I could. So in many ways, that, I use that, um, I guess, negativity to spur me on to become better than. And in many ways, without that, I perhaps wouldn't have been able to achieve as much as I have done. That's a really good point. I find that uh, women need to prove themselves and work harder um, because if they fail, they'll be like, oh, that's because she's a woman. She couldn't handle it. And so we're trying to prove everyone wrong. Um, I, I, at least that was, I, I really think, part of my history is that I wanted to show them that I could do it, you know, and, and that served me well, actually, to be honest with you. You know, I wrote, I, I excelled, I did well in school, I got scholarships, I got, you know, good jobs, I was promoted, you know, but I kept, I kept working really hard for it, but it was really because, you know, kind of a pride thing and being, I didn't want to be called out being a woman who couldn't do it. And back on the other example about, um, you know, you know, a certain experience, there's this one that I'll share. And that was, was I was CTO at this company. And, um, you know, we would be around the table with many engineers. And, and I likely was the most educated PhD in aerospace engineering. And, you know, a customer would know this and they would ask, you know, we'd be, have a room full of, a, you know, a lot of people and might ask me to get them a cup of coffee. You know, and I would just turn and ask someone else to do it, you know, um, because I'm, you know, I'm not, not the administrative assistant or, you know, the person who gets the coffee, you know, I was running the business, but there was just, you know, or, or times when, when they would not look me in the eye and I would ask them a question and they would turn to my colleague who was only, you know, didn't have ed, um, engineering acumen, but great business acumen. And they would, they would answer the technical question to him, even though I asked it, right? Because they couldn't look at me. So, so that happens and, it's, and it still happens, right? Um, and I'm not gonna change those people. I don't think I can, but I don't have to, um, you know, 
go get the coffee for them, right? And I, and, and I can continue to ask them questions and look them in the eye. And, and what we, we do is mentor people and, and we, we're role models to young men, not just young women as well, right? They see us in these positions, the other engineers, you know, in this company, um, see, see women in, in these positions and they realize, you know, that, I mean, I'm hoping that the younger generation of men and women will change this bias in the future. Really, really good point. Thank you, Melissa. Um, mm -hmm. We're kind of out of time. Um, let's take maybe another minute or a minute and a half, if that's okay for everyone. One of the questions does refer to something quick, so maybe that will work. Why do you think aerospace can make the quickest wins from an environmental sustainability perspective? Let's wrap with that. What can the industry do to kind of have those initial first quick wins? From the engine perspective, I think uh, the quickest win probably accelerate the availability of sustainable lower carbon fuels, um, move us away from kerosene. Um, that, that's still not going to be quick. I appreciate that. Um, and scale up the uh, electrification and hybrid technologies of flight at the smaller end of the market. I think those two combined can really make a huge dent in aviation's carbon contributions within the shorter term. I think the shortest term is really looking at the operations of how we manufacture them, right? And because that's, that's the quick wins, I think, um, in using the renewable energies and, and recycling your products. Um, you know, electrification is awesome and I'm, I'm so the cheerleader for um, electrification, um, but uh, it, it's, gonna take some, it's gonna take longer time than it will in terms of, uh, um, as opposed to recycling and reusing and using renewable energies. Uh, so I think the quicker wins are, are in that aspect of the, the recycling, recycling of um, not just how we make it, but the recycling of the products, right? Um, and, and refurbishing and repair instead of just, you know, having them, you know, go to their graveyard. Yeah. Anyone else want to add anything? No? Amazing. Thank you so much. This was great. Apologies for those that haven't had their questions answered yet. Like I said, um, make sure to, you know, stay in touch and, and um, follow us on all the channels. Um, and yeah, I mean, Vera, Kimberly, Rachel, Melissa, all of you have been amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time particularly Melissa and Kimberly, thank you for taking the time so early in the morning. <laughs> um, no and um, thank you for everyone who was here, who engaged in the chat. Um, yeah, I mean, we might be doing um, similar events to this in the future. I have um, just launched a poll about that. So make sure to give us some answers on that. And um, yeah, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. I won't keep you any longer. And Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.